discussing macro and microaggressions. Um, so two, two of our members will be going first with their presentations. I just want to let everybody know this would be our end discussion. Um, if you can please post questions or and also post like what do you think microaggressions and macroaggressions means to you? I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. All right, um, sort of to get things started. Hi, my name is Abby Watson. Um, I'm VP, Vice President of the Black Student Union. Um, I'm a freshman here at the university. And today, the Black Student Union is going to be presenting a few things. I'm going to be starting off with a celebration of Black women history. Um, and also just a little bit of a conversation slash prompt to get people thinking. Um, I think Faduma is doing African culture and um, a discourse in that. And then like what Ian said, after that, we're going to be doing some microaggression, macroaggression talk just to get like some discourse going. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna share my screen real quick if y'all don't, I don't know, give me some time. Not super tech savvy. Okay, okay. Okay, here we go. Can y'all see? Yes. Okay, sounds good. So, starting off, I will be doing a presentation on Marsha P. Johnson. Um, so, Marsha P. Johnson is somebody who m many people might not know people who are in you know the lgbtq community probably do know but is one of the like integral people in starting the gay liberation um sexual awakeness and just gender theory like getting it to the forefront of media all right so some people might describe her as an activist, a drag queen, friend, a trans leader, community advocate, somebody that they saw around if they were alive back then in, you know, in that side of New York. It's just important to recognize that people know somebody. Like these aren't just people who come out of nowhere. These are people that were alive and had an impact on people's real lives and everyday lives. And uh, to keep it going, so her early life, to explain a little bit more about who she was, she was born as Malcolm Jr., Ma Malcolm Michael Jr., in a relatively poor area of Elizabeth, New Jersey. Uh, she had six siblings that she was pretty close with, No, nothing like out of the ordinary in upbringing, besides that she was transgender she didn't necessarily call herself that because that wasn't like the language at, at, of the time and nobody really was able to talk about it openly because it was so suppressed which we'll get into that later um but she was a methodist episcopal well that isn't spelled right but she was <laughs> she was brought up in a methodist episcopal church and her father and mother were very devout and she remained devout throughout her life and even took interest in catholicism as well which wasn't her go-to but she did always always keep a devout um, spiritual belief in christianity and catholicism at her base uh, she was pretty aware of what she wanted to be and what she wanted to do and how she wanted to move around in life so she started wearing dresses from an early age of five but was pretty much squashed into being a regular child because of the harassment that came from the neighborhood boys harassment from her parents teasing from her siblings so she you know suppressed it until she was able to you know do things that were a little bit out of the ordinary do things like wearing makeup for like in the 60s super strange strange to see boys wearing makeup in you know middle school or in elementary school so she was always doing something always feeling like she wanted to be who she wanted to be and so she was a victim of sexual assault as an adolescent by a another adolescent boy who was older than her and so that was sort of a pivotal moment in thinking that 
being gay openly or being you know trans openly was more of a dream and never a possibility for her um she didn't think that she could be herself because of the societal pressure and because of everybody around her was so would disregard her would talk down to her so she left elizabeth elizabeth um new jersey um when she was 17 and she left with 15 dollars in her pocket and a bag of clothes which is quite impressive that she survived but i mean i guess you have to uh she ended up waiting tables at um i think howard johnson's restaurant and she like waited tables and people would give her flowers and money but ultimately it wasn't enough to sustain her or to sustain a household so she ended up being um a, a prostitute on the street but it was not the kind of prostitution where it's um you know safe not like it's very safe now even but still she had it was more of a survival tool to get by and through the day which was so terrible that it happened but it made her the person that she was and she ended up finding people at her job at howard uh, johnson's restaurant and they were like openly gay and they had you know their own scene and they, their own clubs and bars and she was fascinated with it and she ended up you know wanting to be a part of that life and so she ended up being a part of that world and was one of the first um open transgender people who went to stonewall inn and who was able to go into the bars um so when she subsequently went into the bars uh one day in stone in um Stonewall in 1967, 1969, um, Stonewall Inn was raided. Um, there were riots because the police had, you know, beaten the people inside because they were gay, because it was technically illegal to be an open homosexual, which obviously we have different legislation that allows people who aren't straight and who aren't heterosexual to have rights. Um, so that following year, uh, there was a gay pride rally, the first gay pride rally. And so Marsha and her good friend Sylvia Rivera were integral in making that happen because they were not people who were just going to lie low because they had endured enough of the pain and struggles to, to understand that this is not just, you know, something that you can be pushed off. This is of people's lives and they know it's their community that shouldn't have to go underground and even when they were underground they were trying to be found like people wanted to express themselves and live their everyday lives because not doing that is barely life and so um in 1970 star was founded with her good friend sylvia rivera and it was street transvestites action uh, revolutionaries and it was something to like get the LGBTQ community together. It was something that, you know, brought lesbians and gays and bisexuals and trans people together because at that point there wasn't that kind of group. It was, you know, there was that part of town, but there was never like an open group and somebody that, you know, we can have this place where we can go to and we have this community where we're, you know, talking about all this stuff. It's just, you know, now it's here and now we can actually do things. Um, so Sylvia Rivera is another person who was super um, important in making this happen. She was very, very outspoken, somebody who was um, very like exuberant and loud and like would let people know what she had to say because she wasn't going to like endure all the hardships of life and be quite on top of that. Um, so because they were so you know passionate about living their lives how they how they felt were correct and how they wanted to they made star house which was um a place where people on the street like young teens could come instead of going into prostitution or street hustling uh they made star house so people it was sort of like a ymca kind of thing but you know much less funded and more of a community based instead of just people from around uh it ended up being not super successful because 
finances weren't great and so they ended up having to close up star house um like a three years after that so didn't last too long but it was somewhere that people could go and they'd have like events and meetings of just where there was a community for people who were younger and people who were older and honestly it was just a great place for transgender people to be because outside of that one neighborhood in New York there wasn't much you know leeway for people who weren't white heterosexual males or even white heterosexual females um so in 1973 because Marsha and Sylvia were so like loud and t like telling people that we want gay rights that is something that we deserve um they were kicked out by the gay and lesbian um, heads of the groups because they were seen as too loud and you know not appealing to um, the masses so it would hold them back in the movement altogether so Marsha and Sylvia were specifically told that they could not come to that year's pride parade because they didn't want them there and for pretty not great reasons honestly i mean looking back on it we can all say that that was a bad move y'all shouldn't have taken out the creators and the founders of you know the movement to get to you know further your own goals instead of waiting for everybody to get their rights and she was not really having it. She went to the protests anyway. She went to the rallies anyways. And um, in 1973, there was a rally and on the news, she got the microphone and she said, darling, I want my gay rights now. So she was somebody who for sure knew what she wanted and knew what was supposed to happen. It's just that people wouldn't let her do it. People wouldn't let her, you know, be who she wanted to be because they were either scared, super transphobic, homophobic, xenophobic, all of that. And um, so pictured here is, you know, lovely collage of Marsha um, and also uh, the one in gray on the, like right here, that is Sylvia Rivera, her good friend. And over here is Victoria Cruz, somebody who wasn't particularly close with Marsha when she was alive but was and is now somebody who is looking into what happened to um, Marsha when she passed and like how come it is a cold case. We'll get into that a little bit more later because it's a little bit complicated. And even though she was, you know, banned from um, the the movement and all the rallies she still supported the lgbt uh liberation movement because she knew that it shouldn't just be for one section or one group of people because that's not true liberation that is suppression and oppression of another people uh, she still went to drag shows she really enjoyed you know being with the people that she um you know enjoyed the most and she was you know somebody who didn't really like not being a part of the crowd and she loved being somebody who you could see and she always wore flowers fresh flowers in her hair people would often say that she wasn't the best singer but she was somebody who could get like the crowd going and like just somebody who who you wanted to be around wanted to know um she also was fairly renowned for outrageous outfits, some that wouldn't always go together if, if um, you saw her on the street, like red heels, long, fluffy, blue robe, crop top shirt, sort of, sort of out there, but she was recognizable in that way. And um, she also was a little bit scorned and bitter about um, how she was treated by the movement and by the gay and lesbian groups specifically but she still understood that they're people and that they just want their rights as well so when the aids epidemic hit in the 80s she was still here for like to, for as a shoulder to cry on still there as like somebody who you could talk to as like a resource she um was often you know seen 
with people at vigils and like always holding hands and like giving people things like if somebody said like oh my god you have such a lovely scarf she would probably give it to them because that's just how she was and she cared so much about the community even though they didn't show that care back i'm not saying that she was a perfect person because nobody is there's no way that anybody could you know have a completely good side to them because the her upbringing was so you know suppressed and so just beaten down that sometimes when she wasn't you know feeling her best she would change her her mood and her, her people would call her alter ego as her birth name as Malcolm and she would usually have like a lower voice then she would be aggressive she would start in fights she would get you know get into bar fights and all that kind of stuff and she would go to the hospital and often be sedated and then after a month after all the medication wore off she would be back to her regular self and people really enjoyed her and really still loved her um unfortunately she did pass in june i think it was june 28th of 1992 because um after a pride parade there it's not completely sure what happened to her because she was just found in the river um the police ruled it as a suicide but the community was very unhappy with that conclusion and once an investigation to this day um it's deemed as a cold case which Personally, I don't believe because I feel like somebody who was so, you know, loving and was loved by their community wouldn't have just jumped in the river, especially if there was, you know, problems with potential mob people, uh, problems with the police, constantly harassing them, constantly beating them. Um, And this isn't a case that, you know, is rare. This is still going on to this day. And... Uh, this, you know, isn't something that we need to, like, be like, oh, man, that sucks so much. Sorry. We should, like, you know, pay attention to what's going on because this is, like, going on since, like, the the 60s and 70s. This is going on, like, this year. Um, There have been 32 trans women who have been killed this year alone, and it's super important to realize that trans women are attacked a lot and also BIPOC trans women are getting a lot of the um, assaults and aggression and murders as well. Like 80% of the overall um, trans murders have been brown and or black women. Brown and or trans women are getting assaulted and murdered every day. And I mean, this isn't something that we should completely look over. Shouldn't we? We shouldn't look over this at all because this these are people's lives. These are real people, and Marsha was one of them. Um, She is super influential in the LGBTQ community. Um, I'm sure that people know RuPaul Drag Race, um, and RuPaul has been stated to say and been quoted to say many times that. Um, RuPaul's Drag Race couldn't have happened if Marsha didn't do the pioneer work that she did. Like, there was nothing that um, she could have done because if Marsha wasn't around, it wouldn't have happened. Marsha was, you know, one of the innovators for drag, like, you know, wearing the makeup, like, all large, wearing the you know, the heels, the outfits, singing the songs, the routines, all of that. Also, Marsha is somebody who didn't, again, identify as transgender, just more somebody who was, somebody who was gender fluid, gender queer, somebody who wasn't, you know, I am this or I am this. They were like, I can be whatever, whenever I feel like it. So another person would be like Deb Rodman. He is a heterosexual man, but he also explores his identity and like how he expresses himself with his hair, his earrings, his clothing. And in the 90s, a little bit controversial that he was doing that because people saw him uh, as like super masculine guy, but was doing these feminine things. So Marsha's like almost existence is, brings about a discussion about what is masculinity or femininity what is 
you know, what are gender roles in our society. Um, another person who has been influenced by Marsha would be Laverne Cox, who is, you know, a transgender woman who is an, a phenomenal actor. I'm sure some of you have seen her on Orange is the New Black on Netflix. She's just so great. And it that's not like the extent of what she can do. She's a trans woman, but she's also an activist, um, a, an author, somebody who's been on the cover of Time before. Um, so Marsha's reach is, you know, it goes out there. Also, the last person on this um, page is Princess Nokia. She's a musician and a rapper. Uh, she is bisexual, queer. She's somebody who is, you know, who has been heavily influenced by Marsha because, you know, it's somewhere in New York. She also lives from New York. Uh, she goes around the same areas that Marsha did, and she recognizes what has been before her, and she, like, incorporates that into her music, into her art, into, like, her clothing and fashion. It's just something that she knows has been integral and part of her world. Also, uh, Marsha's legacy is not gone. It's not completely done. Uh, you can see all sorts of types and types of like um, art and movies. So for art, she has a, a 2012 mural featuring her for her friend, um, Sylvia in Dallas. And there's also a Homo Riot and Sirianni uh, wall mural in New York City. And that was for the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, and it's in the LGBT uh, Museum in New York. Uh, there's also some statues that uh, are are going to be erected in this next upcoming year and two years, and there's just so many things that people have seen and can now fully recognize, not only in her own hometown, but in New York City, where she lived for a long time, but also throughout the world. Um, I'm sure that people have, if they know Marsha beforehand, they have seen like pictures online and like artwork, just showing that people who might not have ever known her can still feel her reach. <laughs> And there's just this one last quote I want to leave y'all with from Marsha. And it's, she was talking about how there were, there were, there were statues put up for um, one of the people who were killed in Stonewall in Ohio. And she was talking about how like two statues doesn't make anything better. I mean, it's good to commemorate people, but it's not taking any further steps towards, you know, actual legislation or people's values or what people, how people interact with each other. So she said, how many years does it take for people to see that we're all brothers and sisters and human beings in the human race? I mean, how many years does it take to see that we're all in this rat race together? Which is so great to hear that people are acknowledging and that she's acknowledging that we're all together. There's, there should be no divides of sexuality, gender, um, race, class, any of that. There shouldn't be, you know, divides because we are all people at the end of the day. All right, that is the end of that presentation. And I just want to say that personally, learning about Marsha was super inspiring because she always had like the courage to do things that I know not everybody has. And people like her who push themselves and push their community to be better are super important for making change for people in like the way far future, even the near future. All right, ooh, beeped at me. Oh, did it again. All right, gonna exit and go on to my next slide. Everybody don't look, I'm putting it up. All right, here's the next one that I'm doing. Oop, don't look, don't look, it's not on the right slide. Here we go, here we go, all right. So this next person that I'm gonna be talking about is an author, a novelist, an anthropologist, um, short story writer, folklorist, and ethnographer and filmmaker. Her name is Zora Neale Hurston, as y'all can all probably read from the title. Um, she is 
somebody who is super important in you know the the space of black women and in the space of literature so i'm just gonna get in started so y'all can get a basis of who she was and what she's about so she was brought up in eatonville uh florida that's where she lived for a good majority of her young life uh she wasn't actually from there but she liked to tell the people at school that she was from there um and that place was very very strange and unique in the era that she grew up in because it was she was born in 1891 on january 7th and at that time there weren't any places like eatonville because it was the first black township and only black township it was you know settled 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 by black people and um it had predominantly black people as the residents as well so there wasn't any form of you know um racial tension because it was all people who looked like you it was you know only people who looked like you and were who who had the same self who had the same sense of self and especially in that time of jim crow and lynchings it was super super unique in that way that there was no comparison to whiteness there was no um comparison to your oppressors it's just everybody's here everybody's normal there's there's no reason to not like your your neighbor um her she was educated at Howard University, Columbia University, Barnard Uni Barnard College and she also was an independent scholar for a long time as well just because she was so interested in the world around her. She also very much liked to travel. Uh she was the fifth of eight children. She was raised in a Baptist Baptist church and her father father was a minister uh that was super super important in her upbringing because her dad played a major role in how she would see the world how people would like react with her how she would you know go about in her own family um she was different than her other siblings because she was she wasn't afraid to be herself she wasn't afraid to you know run with her brothers and you know just be who she wanted to be she wasn't trying to be boxed in because she saw that her father was while he was a minister he did cheat on her mom a lot so he didn't she did never wanted to be in a relationship where she would be boxed in or held to a lower standard or anything like that because she knows she can do better and that she deserves better she also has sort of a funny story i think it's funny she had a christmas where she asked for a horse and her dad would told her that ah, i don't know how you got in this family know how uh because she wasn't like the rest of his children she wasn't like you know super respectful hey, you, don't yes it seems like we're short on time are so, we short on time yes oh, um been for so long so um it just seems like uh if we could just have uh faduma uh present yeah yeah I can abby you did such a great job and it's really awesome and you just are very knowledgeable and you're i'm so happy no thank you ian for cutting me off uh sorry Faduma, i did not see the time uh yeah i'll pass it to Faduma. no right no now. worries i was not looking at the time either so okay. let me stop sharing so other people can talk Sounds good. So I will attempt to share my screen. All right, can, can everybody see this? Okay, I'm getting a head nod. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, hello everybody. My name is Faduma Omar. 
Um, I am the secretary with the Black Student Union. Um, just a little bit about myself. I love talking about myself, so this will be nice. Um, I am a student at the doctor uh, in the doctor of pharmacy program here at UM. Um, I grew up in Colorado, but my ethnicity is Somali. My parents um, immigrated from Somalia back in the 90s to the US. Um, so I am Somali. Uh, when I was asked to uh, do this presentation, obviously I absolutely loved it. I could talk about Africa forever. Um, something I'm really passionate about, something I really love. Um, the reason that I labeled this presentation the vast world of Africa is because to me and probably a lot of other Africans is that Africa is just a whole other world. It feels like it. There's so much culture. There's so many people. Um, there's so much to know. There's so much to learn. Um, so I'm glad that the Black Student Union is bringing a little bit something about Africa. Um, you know, as Black people, it is important to acknowledge our African roots. So thank you for being here today and for listening. Um, so like I said, there is a lot to talk about with Africa. So um, I'll just try to give you a little snippet about certain countries and um, kind of tie that to current events as well. All right, so our country, so the continent of Africa has 54 countries, if you didn't know, and nine territories. Um, the population is more than 1.1 billion people and it's rising rapidly. Um, over 2,000 languages are spoken throughout. 2,000 is a lot. Um, and there are more than 3,000 tribes also in Africa. Um, yeah, so just by those numbers that are on the screen, you can already tell there's so much in Africa. And also, let's not forget the civilization started um, on these very lands. So if you want to talk about African history, you will have to start from the beginning of time. Like I said, um, Africa is a beautiful continent. Um, it has so much culture, has so much history, has so much amazing food, amazing music. Um, it's a land of beautiful people. Uh, the African people are lively, they're bright, they're ambitious, um, and they also are very free-spirited. So um, what I wanted to bring to the diverse you, since I mean I could talk about Africa forever, um, I thought what a better way um, to kind of bring a little bit of awareness um, to all of you about what's happening in Africa. So what I will be doing is kind of uh, mentioning a tidbit of a select few countries that need awareness and then kind of tell you what's kind of happening today in those countries. So I will start off with my own country, of course. Um, I, so Somalia, um, it is a country in East Africa. It is the Horn of Africa. Um, the capital is Mogadishu. Um, most uh, people in Somalia speak the Somali language, but there are very different um, dialects as well. Um, so, you know, there are certain languages that have other dialects, so you could just know one dialect or you could know a whole bunch. Um, so most African countries uh, were colonized, um, so Somalia received their independence in 1960 uh, from Britain and Italy. The north side of Somalia was colonized by the British and the south was colonized by the Italians. The population is 15 million, um, and because there was such a big civil war in Somalia, there are actually about equal or a little bit more Somalis out in the rest of the world outside of Somalia um, as compared to the people inside the country. So Somalis are very nomadic people, and they have spread out due to their civil war. Um, Somalia uh, sees the highest annual livestock sales in Africa. Um, they do a lot of, um, a lot of the camels that are in the Middle East and the rest of the world are actually raised in Somalia. So that is pretty great. Um, so kind of what is happening with Somalia today? Um, there is a lot that happens with Somalia. Um, there was a civil war um, that began in about 1991. And at that time, uh, there was a refugee camp that was established. It is called the Dadaab Refugee Camp. 
Um, it is in Kenya, right off the Somali border. Uh, the population of this refuge, refugee camp is um, 300,000, and that's 300,000 registered people. So there are still a lot of people who are not registered um, that are still in that. So the population is about over that number. Um, it is actually still the largest refugee camp in the world. Um, it's also the longest opened refugee camp in the world. Um, one thing that I thought was pretty interesting that I wanted to share um, so I was watching a TED talk um, from a man and he had went and visit, visited the Dadaab refugee camp and um, he had spoken to a woman there and she was about 31 years old and she had her three, two or three year old child with her and he was having a conversation with her and he had asked, she was a Somali woman and he had asked her um, what city in Somalia she had fled from. And she looked at him confused and asked um, kind of, oh, what do you mean? And he said, oh, like what city in Somalia are you from? And then that's when she kind of giggled and told him that she was actually born in that refugee camp. She was 31 years old. She was born there and she had her children. So that kind of gives you a perspective of how long the camp was open. Um, so it's kind of food for thought. The next country that I'll be talking about is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The capital is Kinshasa. Um, they speak a few languages there. They were colonized by the French, so they speak um, French, Kituba, Lingala, and Swahili. Um, it is a very populated country. The population is 84 million and uh, they received independence uh, from Belgium in 1960. Um, a little bit about what is happening in um, the Congo that kind of needs awareness is um, a, the people of Congo are, are bleeding. Um, they are struggling. Their children are struggling. The people are struggling because um, they're being forced to work at um, certain camps, uh, certain, um, certain um, kind of plants that produce cobalt and other natural resources. A lot of natural resources come from the Congo. And um, so the people of Kinshasa and many other cities in the Congo are being overworked um, in order for these natural resources um, to be put out of the ground and into over to places in Europe, over here to the US, over to places in Asia. So um, it's kind of something to think about and bring awareness to. Um, you know, it's easy, it's nice, I guess, for all of us to um, have all of the nice resources that we have here, but just kind of thinking about where they come from um, is also something to think about. Do you have a quick question? Yeah. Um, how would you compare the um, the labor camps in the Congo with the cobalt to um, to the labor camps in South Africa with their with the diamond mines? Right. I know that is also a problem. Um, so with the entire African continent, there are so many natural resources um, that come out of Africa. Almost everything that you know, you're probably using right now, probably you're sitting on right now, uh, comes from Africa, whether that's diamonds, cobalt, whether that's zinc, other materials and stuff like that. Um, the situations are very similar. Um, what's different between what's happening in South Africa and what's happening in Congo is that South Africa's um, government legislation has um, certain, I wouldn't say better restrictions about what's going on and who they can work, how often they can work and things like that. Um, but what's happening in the Democratic Republic of, of Congo is um, a little bit different because of legislation. There aren't really rules in place. People are protesting um, to you know, have that kind of brought to everybody's attention across the world. Um, but there's only so much that the people can do. You know? so, but that is a good comparison about what's happening in South Africa as well. Cool, thank you. Um, so Namibia is the next question, is the next country. 
Um, Namibia is in Southern Africa. It's right next to South Africa in, um, and Botswana. Um, the capital is Windhoek and the population is about 2.4 million um, languages. Uh, they have about 30 different recognized regional languages. Um, like I said, you know, Africa has so many different languages in each and every country. So they do have a lot in this country. Um, they were colonized by the Germans. Uh, Namibia, Namibia specifically went through a lot of um, hardship with getting um, their independence. Most African countries got their independence in 1960 and Namibia just got theirs in 1990 um, from the Germans. Um, so what's happening in Namibia? Youth have been protesting and demanding immediate political action on sexual gender-based violence in Namibia. It's a really big problem. Um, there have been at least 200 cases of domestic violence uh, reported monthly, while more than uh, 1,600 cases of rape were reported within the past, the past two years. Um, yeah, like I said, Namibia is a very beautiful country, beautiful people, great people. So it's sad that they are suffering from this, but, um, you know, with the younger generation that is there, I've seen protests, I've seen kind of what they're doing to kind of bring awareness. And it is really heartwarming what they're trying to do for their people. And I think that we would benefit from also bringing awareness to what's happening in Namibia. Um, Cameroon, Cameroon is in West Africa. Um, the capital is Yuande, the population is about 25.2 million. Um, in Cameroon, they speak English and they speak French mostly uh, just because they were colonized by the British and the French, um, but they do have many, many tribal languages. Um, they got their independence from France and Britain in 1960, like most, um, like most African countries. They got their independence around 1960 and 1961. Um, there is a lot happening in Cameroon right now. Um, they actually, for the second year, have been the world's um, largest um, displacement or internally like displaced um, country, which is pretty sad. Um, there's a lack of leadership in Cameroon. There's lack of funding. Um, and when that happens, children don't go to school. Um, people are not able to work under conditions that um, are healthy for them. They're not able to provide for their family. Um, if you look at the numbers on the screen, um, 969,000 people are internally displaced. 855,000 children remain out of school in the Anglophone regions, and about 60,000 have fled to the neighboring country of Nigeria for help. Um, Cameroon is a very beautiful country. It has so much culture, um, amazing food, I can promise you that, and beautiful music. Um, so it is sad that their people are um, kind of suffering from this as, as well for the second year in a row. Um, Nigeria is our second, is our last country. The capital is Abuja. Uh, Lagos is the more uh, more popular city and is the largest city in the country and in the continent as well. Uh, the population of Nigeria is 190 is 195 million, uh, and they received their independence from the British in 1961. Um, so, what has been happening in Nigeria? Um, so, SARS is a special anti-robbery squad. Um, it is a controversial Nigerian um, police unit that attacks, escorts, and kills innocent youth. Um, there have been many nationwide protests demanding to end police brutality in Nigeria. Um, police brutality is something that we're very familiar with here with in the United States. And, um, you know, it's not, we're not the only place that is suffering from it. Um, so the people in Nigeria have been protesting. Um, to end SARS for a couple of weeks now. Um, the protests still go on, um, but the Nigerian people do um, need the world's help with this one. Um, yeah, so it's important to remember that Black lives do matter everywhere, including in Africa. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I wanted to use this opportunity to kind of bring awareness to what is happening in Africa. Um, you know, I could, there is a lot of other countries that are also suffering um, from many things, um, but these are the ones that I could, could kind of touch on um, right now. Um, I just want everybody to be mindful um, and, you know, be the change that you want to see in the world here and in, all, in Africa and all over the world. So does anybody have any questions for me? Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump in here because we are at time. Um, yeah. And so for those of you who need to hop off the call, that's totally understandable. But I imagine there'll be some folks who are interested in sticking around for some questions. Um, there was um, one post by Ben in the chat um, regarding your presentation, Faduma. Um, ben was asking, what can we do here in the U.S. to help out Somalia, DRC, and other uh, countries in Africa? Right. So um, what I did here today is that I was bringing this to um, everybody's attention, um, whether you knew about it or not. I think the, the best thing that you can do is use your platform to talk about this. Um, what you could also do is educate yourself. Um, you know, if you don't know much about African countries in general or what's going on, whether it's injustices or about people's culture, it is important that you educate yourself um, and kind of educate the ones around you. Um, I found out a lot about what was happening specifically with Nigeria and the NSARS SARS movement from social media um, and from speaking with my Nigerian friends. So, I mean, the internet is a very good tool that we have today, um, but also so is word of mouth. So when I heard about it, um, I, you know, talked to my family later today and I asked them, did they know about what was happening in Nigeria? And they actually did not. So I educated them about what I learned that day. Um, so um, even if you don't have a big platform on social media or in life, um, it is important to educate yourself and share, share, share. There was one more question that came through in the chat um, and not sure if you um, know much more um, about how SARS sort of got to where it is today. Like what has led up to kind of the, the breaking point that it seems we're, we're seeing in Nigeria right now? Yeah, so, um, so from what I know, um, SARS, the special anti-robbery um, unit was created to kind in Nigeria, Nigerian cities to kind of um, Kind of attack the robbery problem to kind of attack um you know the issue that was happening with um you know robbery break-ins um people getting attacked on the streets uh people getting raped on the streets stuff like that um but it was it's kind of an abuse of power type of thing um this the sars um unit um started to attack the younger generation um, for doing everyday things like we do here, for going out with their friends, for using their phones, for wearing what they like. Um, so, and using that abuse of power to attack and kill um, Nigerian people in Lagos and other cities. Um, so I think the breaking point was kind of that our generation, um, people that are usually my age, 22, older, anywhere around that, um, kind of were fed up with what is what is going on. Um, their people are being killed and they wanted to do something about it. Any other questions? Ian, what are you thinking? Is that time for us or do we have time? Um, it is time for you, but we can, if people want to stick on, um, they're welcome to, we don't have anything, we don't have anything on this link after, um, this session. So whatever, whatever you want to do. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I asked a question earlier. Um, this is not, this is brief. It's not going to be very long. Um, I asked, oh, first of all, I want to introduce myself. I am the, uh, treasurer of the black student union. Also, I am the vice president of the diversity and inclusion of the IFC, which is the Fraternity Council here at the University of Montana. Um, so I have been um, 
educating people when I speak to them, um, and as well as at BSU for many years, we have been explaining what microaggressions are. So I have asked people to post on the chat, what do you think what a microaggression is and a macroaggression? Do we have any answers for that? Do you have any questions? Also, y'all can unmute yourselves if you want to talk instead of typing. You don't have to post it in the Yes. Does anyone want to ask any questions or tell me what you think about what a microaggression is? I would think that a microaggression is something that's seen as socially acceptable, whereas a macroaggression is more uh, overt and not seen as acceptable. And they're both forms of racism or oppression. Correct. That is a perfect answer for that. So a microaggression is definitely a act uh, verbally or um, is a verbal act on a daily basis that is intentional uh, toward um, indignities. Um, so that meaning um, a lot of uh, students of color and just in general in society, we have experienced daily microaggressions. Uh, we love to educate people about that. Um, one of the strongest things that we try to promote is that cultural sensitivity is a very important asset if we all want to consider ourselves as one Americans. Um, so what I would want to say is that next year we will be having a diverse, um, not, I'm sorry, next year we will be having an event and it's going to be called, um, it's going to be called Educate the Willing. Um, keep that in mind, Black Student Union will be having this event. You are all welcome to come, as well as come to the Black Secretary Summit on February of next year, next semester. So, Examples of microaggressions. Okay, so a microaggressive is say that two women meet and one of them is Caucasian, the other one is a black American. Um, and when a when the Caucasian female acknowledges the, the black American, um, she also says you have pretty hair and proceeds to touch her hair. Um, I don't think nobody in this chat would like to just have their hair touched by a random person. And this is a microaggression that has, is, is, is a very, one of the very big ones that happen, especially to black women. Um, also a microaggression is uh, like, uh, like a stereotype, um, you know, like black people love chicken, um, you know, like, oh, or, um, more microaggressions were be based on um, where if if I sat here and a, 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 I met a Caucasian person and they're just like, oh man, you're just so smart. And they say it in a way that offends me. That is very microaggressive. I don't know where they're coming from, but it seems like like it just is, is just something we deal with on a daily basis as black students and black Americans here in the country. Um, a macroaggression is when if I was walking down the street and um, I experience a Caucasian person walking in front of me, they look at me, they don't know me, they don't know my name, and they all of a sudden cross the street. That is a macroaggression intention, very macro. Um, that is telling me that I am dangerous. That is telling me that the, even though this person doesn't know me. So these acts are one of the highest issues that uh, we deal with. Um, like I said, uh, we will be doing a full explanation. Uh, it seems like someone asked a question. What is it? Touching her comment, her being, yes. So, when, Ian, do you mind if I jump in right here? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so in the hair thing, it's both the, you know, actual touching of the hair and like, say if you said you have such good hair, 
like most of the time when people say you have good hair if you are you know not white it means that your hair is loose curls very like you know bouncy you know not like this hair type it's more just like you know wavy and caucasian-esque but also you know has some curl to it and that is saying like your hair is so nice um it's not like you know my hair it's so flat it's so uh it's not like you know too much volume it's not like you know all over the place it's like saying that you are good because your hair is you know the way that it is but not in a way that is like oh my god your hair is so nice today your hair looks like very beautiful it's saying like in comparison to other things and also the act of touching your hair for me is more problematic i have had all too many people come up to me and like touch my hair and feel like they are entitled to touch my hair to touch me when one i don't know them they didn't ask for permission and also they just feel like they should because their hair is different my hair is different from theirs and in order for them to get i don't know all the sensory you know feelings that they need they need to touch my hair and they need to get out of you know their they need to get out of their way of thinking that thinking that you know this is what i need to do and what i need to feel like their hair is you know up for grabs like but no it's not it's not your hair you didn't ask it's not anywhere that you should be touching okay yes all right yeah, also that has happened to me many times so if you do that maybe stop and if you see that maybe say something well yeah it would never occur to me to touch another person ever but i regardless but it was just my question about the comment of you know your hair is beautiful because i tell specifically women all the time how beautiful i think they are just because i don't think women get told that enough as it is so i it 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 concerns me because i don't ever want to be thought of as being as saying something that i shouldn't be saying or being um or saying a microaggression and doing it in a way that is inappropriate yes so, for sure <laughs> um you want to get this or i'll talk about it um you can go ahead yeah. So yes. Yeah, so as uh, students at the University of Montana, we also experience uh, microaggressions in a classroom. Um, there are certain cases where teachers would act. Um, sorry, professors would make um, basically a mockery term that is extremely offensive to us. And um, for instance, there is a um, black woman in class at one point, and the professor decide to make um when he made a comment to this woman he also made this gesture of a stereotypical this is what black women are type of attitude and accent um it is very disrespectful um especially being in this college a uh, only black person or only couple of black people inside of a room of 100 white students very uncomfortable. This is what microaggressions are. And we're definitely want to educate people on that. And I'll just want to give it back to Abby. Yeah. Um, so sort of like in learning environments where you are, you know, supposed to be learning and having it turned into somebody like making comments about you and what you look like and what they think your culture is and stereotypes it completely like shifts your focus if you are the person who is being told that because you know you're just here to learn you're just here to like converse with your peers you're here to you know absorb knowledge and then somebody taking it to what you look like what they you know like doing this kind of thing like why are you late kind of thing like that's not me that's not why i came here like why are you taking this approach of you know stereotyping me when i might have had like just some stuff going on like maybe i was late because i missed the bus and i had a flat tire so i couldn't like pedal quick enough or something and so you the professors who do that kind of thing are wrong for that but they also in at this college specifically they're all white so they don't have that complete gauge of what is right and what is wrong. I'm not saying that white people are inherently bad or racist or anything like that because 
they're not. And that's a terrible excuse to, you know, do bad things. People should be able to, you know, go about their daily lives because they feel like they should be able to. And that um, uh, the, the students here on campus need a place where they can be able to learn and learn things that are not hindered by, you know, racial bias, sexual bias, gender bias, anything like that. Yes. Any, any other questions? Also, ha ha sort of to look introspectively on ourselves, do y'all think y'all have ever done any microaggressions against another person? I guess just like raise your hand in the chat if you think you have. I'll raise my hand as well, for sure. Um, just because I'm a BIPOC person doesn't mean I'm excluded from, uh, you know, having racist tendencies. In the world that we live in, um, racism is embedded in the system we live in, in the society we live in. Um, also, like, is hearing certain things, like, on the news. I'm not sure where I got it, but, you know, during the Bush administration, there was a whole lot of talk about, like, you know, Mexicans and them taking our jobs, and that was, like, you know, something that I heard a lot, so at school, I would forget, and I used to live in a culturally diverse place, so I was like, wow, Mexican people aren't bad, but I heard it, and I was like, hmm, but then I went to school, and I was like, these are my friends, so yeah, I think recognizing um, racism within yourself is also good, and making jokes not good making you know like offhanded comments saying like you're pretty for a dark skin girl mm. that is just, uh, that's acceptable um to add on to what i Abby said if you if anybody in this chat that is part of the non-bipoc community and would like to learn please attend our black solidarity summit next semester and also, like I said, if you don't know, now you know. Thank you.